Your heart cannot expand unless your heart is broken, unless your heart suffers, unless your heart goes through the pain. That's the only way to expand. If you wanted to expand yourself, you just have to be open to what you don't know. So uh, idea of that uh, another other world, an idea of other beings. Uh, you don't have to understand everything. You don't have to agree on everything. But at least being open to the situation will be already tra- very transforming. The source is that everything comes from that space. That That is a source for everything, every, everybody. Every form comes from that boundless space. Every idea, every thought, formation, uh, all coming from this mind. Mm-hmm. I, essential source of space, awareness, is the source. So today is a special episode. And uh, as many of you might know, I am a scholar practitioner of a few wisdom traditions, including Sufism and Tantra, particularly in the context of Kashmir Shaivism. And uh, I had last year I had done a great episode on Kashmir Shaivism, and I encourage you to go and check it out if you haven't. And so there's another tradition that's deeply touched me, and that's the Tibetan Bon Buddhist tradition, which comes from the land of Tibet. And what is so fascinating about um, Tibetan Bon tradition is that it is nearly 18 to 22,000 years old. I'm always curious to know what the aspirations of some of these radically different ancient civilizations were and how can we learn from them in the challenging world that we find ourselves in today. So for this episode, I had the rare privilege to have a conversation with Rinpoche Tenzin Bengal, who is a Bon, Tibetan Bon Buddhist master and the leader and founder of the Lingmincha International Organization. His students are all over the world in nearly 25 countries, and his teachings have reached millions of people. So this conversation was really a gift for me. I was at a retreat with him, and so we had this short conversation. And in this conversation, we touch on what is Tantra to him. We talk about otherworldly beings and other dimensions, and how can one activate one's infinite creative potential and let us know how we're doing at Potential Paradigms. And if you're touched, please share this conversation. So uh, I appreciate it. And thank you very much. Hello, Tenzin Rinpoche. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Maybe to begin with, Tibetan Buddhism and the Bon tradition, it's such a uh, deep lineage coming here to the West. And from what I understand, it's over 18,000 years old or more, which is hard to sometimes um, wrap our mind around. So maybe to begin with, you are one of the first uh, teachers who came here to the West and to bring uh, Tibetan Buddhism to the West. So could you tell us a little bit about the lineage itself? Sure. Mm-hmm. So, just to correct, mm-hmm. so it's not that I'm one of the first who brought Tibetan Buddhism. Mm-hmm. I am one of the first who brought the burn tradition in the West. So that's a big difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so the burn tradition is the, the oldest spiritual tradition. Of Tibet, and actually, uh, Buddhism was introduced around in seven eighth century in Tibet from India, and so uh, Buddhism and then Burn tradition, which was already there, have merged, influenced each other over the centuries. So uh, this tradition is very unique and uh, very uh, maybe one fifth of the population of Tibet. Uh, or maybe one fourth of the population in Tibet practice quite a lot of practitioners. Uh, so this tradition from from anywhere from West Tibet to all the way to the East Tibet, that it's all over Tibet. So I, my father was from the Buddhist lineage and my mom was from the Burn lineage. So I st- got to study both of them. So, but I more engaged in the Burn tradition. So I'm, I could say that okay, I'm one of the who really brought the Bain tradition in the West, yeah. Thank you for that correction. And how has your reflection been? I know that you had a turning point in your life 
where you could have stayed in Tibet versus uh, come here into the West. Mm -hmm. And so reflecting all of these years, these decades that have been, that you've come here, what is your reflection today on taking this sort of a tradition that went into hiding and is now coming coming into the world? A family with uh, my, my wife, son, 18 years old, so we live here in, in Bay Area. So uh, as far as the teaching concerned, I been it's been the kind of a joy and a struggle. Joy in a sense that I had got opportunity to myself to learn a lot about outside the world in the monastery, uh, world, Western world. I got to learn a lot about all the evolving science and things. At the Rubin Museum of Art in New York City, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche and Harvard neurobiology professor R. Clay Reed met to discuss an ancient Bon practice of meditating in total darkness and how sensory deprivation serves to stimulate brain activity. We know a great deal about the machinery of perception. Um, but we also know from introspection, uh, everyday introspection, or introspection of a deep and richer sense, that our mind is doing something when we're not perceiving. Is this any relation to the heart, to this activity in your brain? Um, what do you mean by heart? So, there's another word. Yeah, oh, sure. yeah well, there's another word. Yeah, if it's a metaphor, it's heart. Of, okay. Of, okay. Of, okay. of human emotion and human extra okay. sensory okay. Heart. Oh. or physical heart. Yeah, okay. Okay. all of it. Uh, the, the difficult side was to try to preserve the tradition, which is coming from thousands of years, um, in its particular form and shape, has been difficult. And so, so I try and find ways to do it, but some aspect is able to preserve and some aspect is not able to preserve because it has to be integrated in you know, the modern society. And somehow, some, some how somewhere you have to compromise, saying, okay, this is good enough to preserve this in this way and open up this in that way. So it's somehow finding both place. And I'm pretty happy in, in a sense, as much as one can be happy, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow, this is, uh, there, there, it's such a, such a deep train and I, I, would, I would like to, to uh, maybe unpack in the little bit of time we have, maybe one of the main themes. So the tradition itself is 18,000, perhaps even older. Sure. And I'm feeling that the more as time recently has been passing, our history is actually getting older. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I was younger, back in school, uh, history only went back to two, 3,000 years or the, or, or the pyramids, and those societies and cultures were, were considered primitive, mm -hmm. particularly from uh, places of the world that have been colonized, sure. which is a lot. Sure. Uh, and uh, it seems that in recent years, everything is getting older from 5,000 to 10,000 to 20,000. And also that these, these civilizations, such as, as you're mentioning, um, the Bon tradition of Tibet, um, it's mind boggling that these civilizations are in a way much more advanced and developed than what we have today, perhaps even in its, its, its own way, in ways that we don't consider sure. as developed. So I was wondering if um, you could say anything uh, about how these civiliz civilizations were different, what their aspiration perhaps was. Yeah, so it's, um, I think uh, it's very complex. Um, so, uh, the ancient civilizations, like an Abhyan tradition, is the ancient wisdom tradition of Abhyan. The fundamental, the view of it is, it's to not, to build the samsara, to not continue with the samsara. It, it is about cutting the root of samsara 
and, and going beyond. So that is fundamentally different. So, so people who have been, uh, all the teachings that have uh, passed down, they are all based on that, that those, those fundamental principles. Uh, as, and based on that, but then, then, of course, when you say something going beyond the personality, transcending personality, going beyond this uh, suffering, um, so as an approach of that, you have a lot of uh, physical knowledge, knowledge of the yoga, physical yoga, that you have a lot of knowledge of the breath yoga, working with the breath, you have a lot of different knowledges about the energy fields, you have a lot of knowledge about consciousness and subtle consciousness, subtle awareness, and in co combining all those things together in our own human body, spirit, and mind in relation to the outside, the na nature, and the physical world. So this is so much knowledge out there. And uh, I think it's fascinating in, in, in some sense that, that many things in a modern society today's world, like where the science is evolving and people are interested in the health and the longevity and living forever and healing. But then you come down to these ancient knowledge, they, they coincide a lot of things, pra practices, principles, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Um, so maybe going to the, to one of the, Heart, like Tantra, for example. Uh, in, in, in my study, I moved to Tantra from after having some spiritual sort of awakening in my life, um, coming from the scientific background, the academic background, uh, into a study where initially the world is seen as an illusion or, or Maya. Um, and then later on being sent to, work, to the study of Tantras because I felt like that that there was something still missing from seeing the world as Maya. I still felt that I wanted to be creatively engaged in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and the quest of what my creative dharma was not known at the time. Um, but it was a painful process to, to discover that. And, and that led me to, to Tantra. So maybe the question I would like to pose here perhaps is, what uh, to you is, is Tantra? Well, Tantra, you can define many different ways. For us, we, we use the word Ngak. Ngak, in Tibetan word, we say Tantra in, in, uh, in Sanskrit. So Tantra is the Ngak, or Tantra is the path of tr transformation. So there are three principal paths. Path of renunciation, renouncing, path of transformation, and path of liberation. So we say panglam, jurlam, trulam. So these three things, and tantra is part of transformation. What does that mean is you, you, you don't uh, completely let it be. That means there is energy there existing. That energy, particular energy, can interfere another existing energy uh, unless they are able to balance and work out. So it has to do with the awareness of the energy and working with the energy and transforming that energy into a higher energy. So basically, the negative energy into a positive energy, um, anger into a love, um, aggression into a peace, uh, sadness into a joy, personality into a non-personality liberation. In that sense, it's about transformation. So that's the word, what Tantra means. But how you do that, so there is, there is whole work in the body, physical level. So when you're doing your physical yoga, postures and movements and breath and visualizations and all those different elements, even the gazes, how you gaze, um, it's a different energy. So, so you're trying to change the energy in order to balance that energy with something else but it's not working. So even as simple, simple as gaze, if you're, follow, if you're sitting this kind of position and you're following sleep, you sit this kind of position, you gaze up, you, it, energy immediately changes. If you are 
if you lie down, you might likely fall asleep. If you sit upward position, you might be more clear. Also, it's all about understand, learning, understanding, and uh, working and transcending the energy which is destructive to a more supportive uh, energy. So that's mainly what Tantra is. Okay, thank you. So I'll try to keep going to, uh, to the heart of if I had one question because we have a shorter time and maybe because these themes are so deep. In our normal experience, there is a separation, even as spiritual seekers, uh, between what is internal as a transcendent realm or the realm of infinite potentiality and what appears in form as our lives here uh, as humans or another being. And I'm finding in, in, in my path that Tantra is allowing me to remove those boundaries as to what, how I segregate what is external and what is internal. And there is a continuous... Uh, integration mm -hmm. um, is if, if that was the tantric path so to speak then is there one question I would have is is there a sort of a divine vision in, in, in which uh, forms are evolving in some way so to speak so first of all you know like if you think about human um, samsaric realm, you have human realm, you have animal, you have many other uh, beings. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a human being, uh, we are also evolving. It's not like uh, we, in terms of physical changes and psychological changes, even formation, you know, even brain, neuroplasticity. We are, it is nothing frozen and stuck. So it's always evolving. Uh, and whatever present condition is, whatever the present form that we exist in, it is also, there could be a situation where it's, it's optimal, it's okay, or it's de deteriorating itself. So that means if, if it's deteriorating itself, means something energetically is not able to work, figure it out. It's, it's able to maintain is good, but that's not good enough. You have to evolve continuously, even physically, psychologically, and spiritually. So that ability to evolve continuously is it, the work of the energy. So, so, so somehow, I think uh, Tantra is that, that understanding and continuously evolving. You know? So, as I said earlier, it's, it's about trans transformation. Uh, it's not being stuck in... The what is manifesting, but the manner what is manifesting is continuously evolve, ultimately realize every manifestation. It's in the end. It's nothing more than it's the nature is its source nature. So it's, it's every manifestation is nothing more than just nothing space, or it's nothing more than it's just a pure energy. No matter how many labels you put into it, no matter how many value you put into it. No, no matter how many um, labor, yeah. So all these things, what we're doing, particularly in the modern society, total illusion over illusion, thousand layers of illusions. No matter how many layers of illusion you put, it's nothing more than just a pure space and energy and consciousness. Mm -hmm. So tantra is always tantra. You know, we say dzogchen is always a kind of trying understanding going. Tracing back, trying to understand the source of the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much. And the way I'm interpreting what you've just shared is that, because um, often as I was sharing, there are certain schools where there is a, a repulsiveness towards um, cosmology or creation, so to speak. You know, it's like, okay, we um, like uh, the idea, and I'm not very familiar with this term, but Arhant versus the Bodhisattva, mm -hmm. where the Arhant is uh, completely, uh, in, in a very superficial way, uh, detached, mm -hmm. in, in my understanding, mm -hmm. superficial understanding, detached, where the Bodhisattva seems much more involved. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like maybe there is a subtle pessimism versus, versus optimism. Uh, yeah, so as long as you are 
in a very practical sense, like yourself and myself. So uh, we can talk about the source being nothing, source being just pure space, pure consciousness, pure light. But we are born in a form. We are born in a particular shape. We are subject to sickness, birth, death, uh, all the challenges. So when you are born in this, this is the manifestation of duality, which is we have manifested. So you, in this process, you always have this opportunity to work with it. So uh, you can optimize in every, everything, you know, your, you can optimize your awareness, you optimize your love, compassion, uh, your health, your sleep, your mood, your psychological state. You can optimize all those things. That's, you cannot deny that. You know, that because this this conventional reality, we are already subject of this conventional reality. So no matter how fancy things you talk about, fancy ideas you have, if you deny this one single manifestation, then you are completely denying the ultimate truth of the ultimate source. Because total respect to the ultimate truth should be total respect to the relative truth. Total respect to the spirit is total respect to the form. So the form needed to be respected. So that's, I think the tantric practices or many of these practices is about working, figuring out together. Because, uh, um, yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's a, sometimes there is, like many times, tradition, coming from a very rich tradition, like Buddhism, Hinduism, and all the rich traditions, uh, there is a chance where of having everything trying to becoming a little more mental understanding, uh, not conscious awakening, uh, not a practical applications. So I think. So that I think what 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 is the what is the good about being in the West? This knowledge is really trying to find that integration, because uh, they need to, to meet somewhere, and that meeting is fundamental. It might not be perfect map meeting. Uh, the closer is better. The farther is divided. Basically, means it's you're dividing the mind and the body. If you divide, if, if you divide science and spirituality, then it's like a division of body and the mind, body and the spirit. If you, but science is very much, so much. I think it's a body, it's a form. I mean, no matter any time when they say they're doing anything, they always, you know, measuring their glucose level, sugar level, or temperature level, or heart rate, or brain wave, or they're measuring some movement and activity. That all has something to do with the body. But we are trying to talk here something beyond that. So that beyond that, and being in the body, they has to match together. They have to come together. Yes. And they contribute together a lot of things, yeah. Yes, and um, you, um, I see you as, as, a, as a champion of this, this integration because you have been involved and you're so passionate about studying using the latest technologies and uh, collaborating with scientists uh, yeah i definitely i will not say myself as a champion uh, i will definitely say i'm myself as a very curious and exploring and self-experimenting and uh, committed to it and working working hard on it and yeah so uh, and i think that not only myself i think everybody should do that because it's somehow it's just basically the idea of sleep, for example. So it's very clear in tantric practices, sleep yoga is very important. Dream yoga is very important. One of the two main things. As far as if you divide day, practice of the day and practice of the night. So in the practice of the night is the sleep and dream two main things. 
and they and they are they, they are both in, in as a, as far as that tantrism is concerned they they are both connected they are both linked to each other there is a connection they contribute to each other they support each other so in the west and science is kind of catching up with it you know if you think about all the practice even the ram rapid eye movement is discovered in the 50s so that's not that long ago you know the people before nobody knew about ram sleep or something like that or now they're talking about the four different stages of this sleep stages now they think there's only three stages so you see so so in tantra in, in this ancient knowledge these are already discussed a length but not in the ancient time you listen to them you hear them you try to apply them and you don't know how you're doing or you're not doing at least you have some sense you might be some you might have uh, the great great yogis and meditator they might have some awareness but there's no physical measurement but nowadays in this for example this little device whoop it gives you so much data and that is clearly uh, valuable data you know it talking about your temperature of the body talking about your hrv um, heart rate variability your resting heart rate your respiratory rate um how long you slept how long you've been sleeping in ram sleep in deep sleep and all those information are very important and they, and they change all the time and you have to find optimal level from the from the point of view of the these kind of devices how do you have optimal level it it every single day is your behavior little thing every day your behavior will show next that night show you that morning that you did not do something right i just i was just playing tennis with a friend of mine he said he he said he cannot imagine not eating dinner he ate not only eats he eats late and he was saying he ate so much he was even feeling a vomiting mm. he said i mean i said how you can do that you know mm. but people do that people do all the time mm. self very self destructive behaviors yeah so so what I, what does that mean in from the practice point of view you are subject to physical conditions lack of one hour sleep one lack i say they say like a, when the when the daylight saving when the night gets shorter one hour getting short shorter next day 24% more heart attacks just because of uh, one hour sleeping less or that anxiety related with the heart attack 24% more mm. so so these are these are facts yes. and somehow our practices should able to comprise so i for personally i know like sometimes i know my f- physical behavior how much these are impacts now from tantric point of view it will be good to okay well i can eat not to be affected or i i would do certain things you know i will i will have exposed to the noise not be affected i will have a challenging situation not be affected so idea will be not to run away from any of these situations but the key is not to be affected by these situations because we you know we get affected by them so physically we can get affected by them more importantly psychologically we affected by them so trying to find a way that your mind is not getting f- impact by the situation even your body is doing it and eventually your body should not be affected by it because your mind is guiding it protecting it so that i think kind of interesting uh, work of the future you know for example many times nowadays many of these devices bottom line is it's, it's escape i was just given the other day i was just given uh, another air, air plug which it it has a noise cancellation and it has a um soothing sounds like a river a creek and things like that so basically you wear it whole night and um 
So I have been. I tried a few few times. So if you listen to it, it it's it's a noise you're listening to it. I mean, it's a beautiful sound you're listening to it, but it's also a no noise. So, but if if somebody is making a noise, your dog is making a noise, you get mad at. If your child is making a noise, you get mad at. But you are creating a artificial sound to you call it a soothing sound is the interpretation of your mind. But you can interpret the same way that the dog or the child or whatever, every sound is the sound of the mantra. Every image is image of divine. Every thought is the thought of wisdom. If that is clearly understood and realized, then this you don't have to create all these devices to, for the purpose of escaping. You you know how to integrate with them. No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so maybe to to connect that with um, uh, with tantric sadhana. Um, I've noticed that as I've been doing the sadhana, I have become more refined. Um, what I was saying, the exploration of creativity, my ear has become attuned to classical music. I became interested in that. I've been studying that. Um, mantras, sometimes I hear a mantra and just I, I know that I need to add it as part of my, my sadhana. Um, at times, without looking at the full moon, I can kind of start feeling that we're approaching approaching there and and then technology is is very useful because it seems like my senses are not refined mm -hmm. but i can see the potential at sadhana sure. mm -hmm. that this uh, the lunar cycle the solar cycles and perhaps even the astrological cycles we have the capacity to sense them yeah. until i feel like till i uh, i evolve to that point uh, these technologies are pretty powerful useful yes absolutely but i think i do think that um uh, I since I'm using them, no, I have not been using very long time from now, only a couple of months. But clearly, some point you wanted to learn kind of your your senses to develop in a way that you can almost read it by yourself, you know, because you kind of, this helps you to how to read it with your, your intuition, your sense. At some point, I think it's good to not to do it, but not, but everything you have learned from it as lifestyle change, behavior changes, you keep them. But as far as the result is concerned, not every every morning you know get up and look at them, but just feel. You can feel it because sometimes it's it's a different. You know, you might have only six hours of sleep. You can feel very great, and then you look. Oh, then you look at the device. You say, okay, well, I have a long RAM and deep sleep within that six hour. Or sometimes you have eight hours of sleep and you look at, you're still grumpy and you're tired, you're not in a good mood. And you look at, you did not have a good recovery or you did not have a deep deep sleep, enough deep sleep. So it's mm -hmm. ability to sense your own body, your own mind, I think for sure is, is the key, you know, not to be so much, uh, some, I mean, nowadays, some of the IT people, they, they almost, they, they depend on this measurement from outside devices so much so, so that kind of loses their own ability to sense. Mm -hmm. they, they lose their intuition, their sense of themselves and, and, you know, in, in terms of what's happening. It's like it's, nowadays people don't know how to write calligraphy, you know, like everybody every, typing everything. It's like kind of we are losing some, some things by technology, but I think technology should help to mm -hmm. build more intuition and sense of self because it, it, it gives you the mirror. Yes, uh, and, and maybe this is an uh, important point, is one, one thing I feel is that the bifurcation between science and spirituality is sort of artificial because it didn't always exist. And a lot of the scientific ideas and breakthroughs come from deeper states of intuition, dream, um, and, and we can create this artificial you know, dogma that they, they are very separate, but in, in fact, uh, they're not. A lot of the states that are cultivated in uh, spiritual sadhana are necessary. Sure, sure. I think, I think it definitely, you know, these technology, in short, all these so far many technologies developed 
especially like biofeedback technology, uh, I think all of their contribution to the spiritual practice and tantra. Yes, mm. yes, absolutely. So maybe connecting it to uh, back to the lineages and some of these civilizations. Um, whereas when I study tantra and look at some of these mantras and some of the views of reality that tantra provides with uh, with uh, practice manuals, mm -hmm. which is very unique. Uh, that it's not just a theory, but you have a practice manual to have some sort of realization. Um, it just boggles my mind at times as to historically that such advanced um, capacities of humans were present even in the past. So maybe in, in Tibetan lineage and also in Indian tantras, the initial dispensation of the tantras have happened through mind transmission. Mm -hmm. And then later on, oral, and then finally... Uh, through written. Mm -hmm. And this is connected with, um, and, and you're the expert on this, but I feel this is connected with, at least in Indian cosmology, the yugas and, and the cycles. Um, so I was, I was just wondering is that, do you think that we, we, can, we also in, in our time and age can uh, develop these uh, capacities to have that level of um, insights from the universe? Sure, I think so. You know, I mean, at least we should try. You know, like that. I, as I'm saying, technology should help build intuition, not lose intuition. Same way, um, so for mind-to-mind -mind transmission, it's that the ability to, and not even a transmission, even the more important than transmission is the, your sense of self. Your sense of self is your sense of self. I mean, how do you experience your sense of self, right? Rather than, so that would be like a mind transmission. Your, your sense of self would be your own in, inner state. The next step would be if you don't have that, if you don't know who you are, people will tell you who you are then now you're subject to opinion of other people's perception of yourself. Mm -hmm. because, because you're going to be dependent on them because you have no idea who you are. So then you have some curious, should be have some curious about who you, are, who you are. And then since I don't know who I am, so I would listen to other people, whatever other people tell. And then there are a lot of people, unfortunately, who tell you your worst self, sense of self. What you cannot do, what you, how bad you are and all those things. Then you identify with them, right? That's, that's the second level. Like, it's like oral transmission. I'm talking about, you talk about the mind, I'm doing the same metaphor. That's oral, oral perception of what people label you. Third, worse, worse part, third, well, people don't even think of or care about what oral other people think. There's no relationship. They only care about what certificate they have. It's a piece of paper that says you have qualification. You are number one lawyer, you are number two lawyer, you are number three lawyer, that piece of paper becomes identity. So identity is clearly defined by a, some piece of paper, a documentation. It's not even relationship with people. For sure, it's nothing to do with your awareness of yourself. So, so th three, three level worse, 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 worse. Same way, transmission is also same thing that your, your presence transmitting something, a knowledge to someone. Your presence blessing you're transmitting to someone. Your presence of your kindness you're transmitting to someone. Or at least your word, a gentle word, a kind word, a specific vocab vocabulary that you choose, it's transmit. Or even how much you say, how little you say, transmitting something. Or that only is depend on your actions. You see, so I think... Um, so that all these teaching practices, technology, I think eventually, slowly, slowly, uh, sh should try to bring us closer to ourselves, not farther away, because we are already so far, far away. Far away, yes. Um, so since we have a little time left, I wanted to maybe have a few brush talks, since I have a luminary such as yourself here, um, of something, a few topics that we can address very briefly, uh, that I feel are very active, have become very active 
in the sphere, the global sphere, through podcasts, YouTube conversations, just sharing of these ideas that have become very dominant. And I feel like uh, they connect with the opening up of possibility in the collective consciousness, so to speak. And one of, um, to take one of the themes would be in, in, in I think in, in tantric studies in India and in, in Bonn, and also in the Abrahamic traditions, the Sufi traditions, um, there is a cosmology. Uh, all these traditions, even in, in my study of Sufism, it, it is very tantric. Mm-hmm. And, and these cosmologies so somehow free us from, oh, I'm this material physical body, I was born, this is my birth certificate, and then at some point I, I die. Uh, the culture widely had this, this idea which I think, um, at least in my history, when I believed in that, it was very fearful, and it it um, it it's a philosophy that restricts what one should do. You know, I should get my pension, I should get insurance, should save money. Whereas, as you become available to the possibility of these cosmologies of multiple realms, multiple dimensions, uh, death not being an, being the end. Um, then there's a lot of creative possibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least I see like, I don't, I don't know what tomorrow looks like, but the only purpose that seems worth following is as creative as possible sure. and fearless as much as possible. Sure. So connecting that to one thing that's become very active, at least here in the West, is um, UFO phenomenology that was considered taboo up till even 10 years ago. Now we're having congressional hearings. We, uh, people in the military who have seen stuff are openly coming and speaking. Um, and it seems less like taboo. And now we have even researchers at Stanford and Harvard who are not destroying their careers if they choose to study this phenomenon. Sure. But if you look at the Bund tradition, uh, even your enormous amount of work and uh, teachings that have been available for decades and India and Sufi traditions, there are these incredible cosmologies Mm -hmm. Um, do you have this is a general question do you have any thoughts on how if if you have been aware of what's happening um, at at the collective level at the collective consciousness this shift Um, because I feel like people are becoming very open just is even from five years ago that the idea of reincarnation or the idea of other dimensions and other beings uh, has become an open question and dialogue more and more. Yeah, I guess um, I think the main important, one of the main important part of life is to be more open toward what you don't know. If you wanted to grow, if you wanted to evolve, if you wanted to expand your self, sense of self, consciousness, your life, ex- richness of life, you just have to be open to what you don't know. And uh, so idea of that uh, another other world, an idea of other beings, um, yeah, I just, I think it's good to, you don't have to understand everything, you don't have to agree on everything, but at least, at le- at least being open to the situation will be already a tra- very transforming, you know, I mean, uh, if you look at life, very challenging situation in life, life life-threatening sickness, or or, or divorces, and losing job, and if you embrace that those situation positively, it always gives you more than what you lost or losing. If you look at the, around the history of the biography of the people's current situation, it oh, this gives you more than what you're losing. But if you only think, identify with yourself and only what you're losing, it never replaces anything because the potentiality is infinite. So what we know is maybe only like a, less than a percent. What we don't know is infinite. So that I think always is, I think, is a blessing to keep that full openness there and work with the, keep that full openness, but not deny any reality. 
I mean, reality there you're experiencing, even they are illusion, you, don't, you, should, you should respect them. If, if it's an illusion, let's say, if there's no demon out there, you know there's no demon out there, but you are afraid it's affecting you, then you means there is a demon for you. Mm-hmm. You have to respect that in order not to be affected by it. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, you have to realize nothing is there, so you won't be affected anyway because there's nothing there. Mm-hmm. It's, everything is working on a potential level. Mm. Exchanges are happening on a potential level. Mm. It's like a a short glimpse of reality arising and disappearing, arising and disappearing, right? So you have this moment. I mean, if you look at the life link, this some, somehow it's very much like that. You know, we, we think it's a big deal in one moment in situation, but they're very, very short moments. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the last statement that you just made about the, the potential and the glimpse of reality um, is uh, could, 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 could be unpacked. Um, uh, may, maybe to close this particular thread that we uh, I just asked you, is this, uh, is this a possibility that all of us uh, on uh, Mother Earth um, are citizens com- coming from uh, very different places, like in, in, in these cosmologies? Um, there, are, there could be higher beings, lower beings, here in embodied form. So we're, you know, because sometimes we, in, in anthropology, we try to find what the source is, mm-hmm. right? This race came from here, this race came from here, everybody came from Africa and stuff. And if you take it even further, um, are we cosmic in that way? Is that a potential? Yeah, and the source source is that everything comes from that space, you know, like, the boundless space. Yes. That that is a source for every, every everybody. And every thought comes from that boundless consciousness. Every form comes from that boundless space. Every idea, every thought formation are uh, all coming from this mind. So source that's the source, you know. Mm-hmm. Essential source of space, awareness is the source. Um, so maybe your last brushstroke on that. Uh, one, one thing that I feel in, in the study of, um, of Tantra is, uh, particularly in Kashmir Shaivism, they have this cosmology of the 118 worlds. Mm-hmm. And may, maybe that's my imagination, but one, one thing I feel is that one part of the study is to become free of samsara, so to speak, and live a more creative and joyful life. And another aspect of it is also cosmic exploration, exploration of the cosmology, which perhaps comes from an innate sense of curiosity. Would you, do you agree with that? So, I'm not sure if you're exactly your question, but so for example, in different tradition, they have they might say there's a different world, right? Like in the Tibetan tradition, there are many many different versions of different world and categories of different world. So that means that at some point collective consciousness has created those worlds, right? So the past collective consciousness has created those past worlds. So so are they there? They are probably there in some way. But there are also potential to have so many more fantastic worlds. The AI world in, in the future it's also we are collectively creating those new worlds out there. So are they, the old one is better? Are they new, better than new one? No, I don't think so. So I think it's the question is, does old one help your imagination to create new one? Or does the new one help imagination to enter into the old one? At the end of the day, is everything, is everything is supporting you for everything, every other things. Or everything in your life is destruct, becoming a cause of suffering or destructive to every other thing in your life. That's the come down to that key point. Mm-hmm. Well, you have to live with life with the full potential. But just in a one moment, you're tapping into the whole past cosmology. And the next moment, you're tapping into the whole future cosmology. 
And third moment is you're tapping into the union of the whole cosmology of the past and the future. That's the life that we wanted to live. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for for that incredible insight. Yeah. And that, that was going to be one of my questions that you just addressed it. And that was... Uh, Time has been an interesting thing. I used to be very interested in quantum physics and being a computer engineer, thinking about time. And um, of course, in, in, in meditation and in these states, we also experience the timeless. And sometimes in, in, in philosophy, in spirituality, there is this idea of there is no time. And what, what I come to feel is that it's more nuanced. Uh, it again goes back perhaps to the form and emptiness. There is the timeless, but time is, is, is an aspect. Yeah. So I think the one thing is always, I think it's important not to get confused from the point, we call it, from the point of view of base of, or the from, from the point of view of truth or, the, or the, from, from the point of view of truth seeker. It's two different things, right? From the point of view of truth, maybe there is no time. You know, there is no... Everything what we see, the truth that we perceive, or we are perceiving what new truth that will come up, you know, like the bicycle to cars to airplanes to the AI to the jets, all these things, they're different truths. And so I think the important is that from the seeker point of view, we have a time. Because if you look at your body, it will tell you age. It will tell you your youth. It will tell you when you age. It will tell you your current situation. Your body defines your past, present, and the future by its appearances. It's the definition coming from the limitations of the body. Its definition is not coming from the limit, limit, I say limitless of the consciousness. So who is correct? Of course, Limitless is correct, not limitation is correct. But once you are in limitation, you have to respect that. So you have to learn about the time. You know, I mean, this is the whole idea about people are trying to study longevity. You know, in a way, it's an interesting concept. I mean, some people kind of hate those things. It's an interesting concept because some, somehow a body, people used to live 40 years, 50 years, now it's 60 years, 70 years. People are... I mean, 80 years, 100 years, people are living longer and longer. That means the body does not have a limit. The condition in which body is living, making those limits to you, to the body. So you are, you are trying to, you are open to exploring how much the limit less of the body can go by, by, by measuring everything in the body and doing anything, everything is possible in the body. It's, it's like a fun, fun journey of exploring it. It's not necessarily afraid of the death. Yes. Exploring yes. that part. Yes. Rather than saying, denying that limitless and willing to die unmaturely death. Mm. That's not a good, mm. good, good, good idea, good attitude, you know. Yes. And so, so I think that possibilities there, ultimately speaking, we say consciousness never dies. Right. Right. And ultimately, form always ceases. Is somehow energy always continues? Is the form always dissolves? Mm -hmm. So they have to. Res that's the condition limitation of the form. Mm -hmm. But how long we can keep it? That you know. Yes. Yes. Um, one of my pivotal moments that I've not sort of publicly spoken about was an NDE near death uh, experience, and in the. Uh, and I, I shared that with you at one point, and the, and the sort of the glimpse that, or the digestion that I'm still doing is, uh, consciousness does not uh, disappear, mm -hmm. so no need for fear. But this, as your as your conversation is very grounding, I find being human, um, is uh, is not easy. It has its challenges. I still need discipline. I have to work hard. Um, and as, as a seeker, as someone who's on the path of transformation, connecting to the last thing you said, I feel like I have to be open to my heart being broken continuously because of the, the, the pain and suffering sure. that could be present in the world. And yet, I'm also realizing simultaneously, I feel like I will always be an eternal optimist. Sure, absolutely. I mean, uh, 
Your heart cannot expand unless your heart is broken, unless your heart suffers, unless your heart goes through the pain. That's the only way to expand. If you look at the simple matrix, like if you like these kind of devices, it tells you two things: recovery and strain. So how you how you how you build strong body? It's not necessarily you know like people are building the body and just the pumping out. That's not strength necessarily. Mm-hmm. Help you know sometimes it's unhealthy to go beyond too much of that, right? But generally, optimal health it it has to do with how you strain yourself, how you how you you have to exhaust, you have to go through, put yourself through healthy stress. You cannot avoid stress. You need a healthy stress, and then you have to you have to rest, recover. Then you have to put when you fully recover, you have to put more stress, not less stress, not yesterday's stress. You have to put more stress because you have recovered really well. That means you work harder today. And you work harder today, and you keep building. Some point there's a limit. You cannot keep doing, it, but you can say, "Well, this is this condition, this physical level. This is optimal. Any human being can go. At least in my case, this is only the optimal level I'm willing to go." But no, most of the time people don't go that far. People, most of the time, people are declining their sense of their body is declining all the time. Their sense of their self is declining all the narrowing down all the time. Because that's not the only way they are narrowing down their sense of self, and the only way they are declining their the energy in their body is they are not they are running away from stress. They are not. They have to increase their stress. They have to increase their pain. Yes. You know, or being exposed to it, being willing to take it in. That's the only way to grow. Yes. So that's so those who wanted to grow. Running is not a solution. <laughs> Running away is not a solution. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, it's, sometimes it's. Uh, I find when you're in the midst of it, uh, it's it's harder to to recognize that. But I hold on to that. And when you're on the other side, and especially you're thinking, especially when you're in the midst of it, you don't have even a choice. Yes. You know, so you can say, well, this this whole idea about embracing is a good idea. I should do it. But the good thing is, better will be you're you're not in the midst of it. You should look for it. You look for challenges, mm-hmm. hardship. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, people even in a physical dimension and health. That's what people do nowadays. You you're stressing your body with cold plunge. You're stressing your body with the sauna heat. You're stressing your body in the gym. You're paying membership fee and getting it stressed out. Paying every day. You're even eating the stress out foods not to get stressed out. Mm-hmm. You're trying to. Now, there are people who love challenges, as long as it's not threatening them. Mm-hmm. They love challenges. There are people who don't like any challenges. Mm. Mm-hmm. Just lazy. Yeah. And la- when you when you are that spiritually or physically lazy, you don't physically or spiritually you don't grow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. This uh, uh, this theme that you you have been highlighting throughout our conversation. Um, that we all as humans are very interested in, I feel like. I, I heard a few of your conversations that I would, I would like to link in this uh, the video uh, is about manifestation. And um, everybody wants to, I feel like as humans, we want to feel unblocked and, and manifest our, our creativity. And I think you had said, uh, sometimes people make it too nuanced. You know, if you just keep thinking on a thought and you have no doubt it manifests, you know, you want a billion dollars and it appears. Mm. And I feel like that it's it's more, there's truth in that, but it's more nuanced as to our karmic readiness, our astrological nuances, and our, our own ripeness. Um, because it's such an important thing, particularly in, in California and in the West, because as you were saying, AI... Uh, there is so much empowerment that's happening now for each person to create something. Sure. Um, what is, to you, what, what is the best way? I know it's a deep topic, but what is the way to, to manifest and feel that freedom? Yeah, I think, again, once again, I think uh, everybody should hear one voice in their head whenever that voice comes up, which is 
this voice which says you are not good enough you are not strong enough you are not creative enough you are, you cannot do it that voice it's 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 in everybody's every human being's head that voice is there but they don't hear it they identify with it mm-hmm. they are that voice and they that that the reason they don't move any direction but when you hear it saying oh uh, whatever whatever the creative something that you can do i mean whatever the life gives you open up a new door and open up a new opportunity a new job new relationship new project whatever shows up comes up you can say uh, if you feel it of course sometimes you can feel it or uh, that seems too much for me that i cannot do it or that's too complicated at least you can say you hear your voice say okay i am i'm saying that and maybe that is complicated for me maybe maybe that is not complicated more for me maybe i will take one time to think about it at least this is a conversation you're having with that voice having those kind of conversation is the beginning of a a a, a door of creativity mm-hmm. but when you don't have any of this conversation with yourself and especially with your limitation then your limitation is you mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. how you know that because nobody is talking to it there's no conversations happening because identity when you're identifying with that you don't see it you don't mm. feel it you don't talk with it mm. when you're talking with that at least you have some space there mm. um in in my own self reference what i find myself is that it shocks me as to how abundant um the cosmos is that i don't have the capacity to guess how something will happen and i also feel like that there is no judgment no matter how many times i fail somehow the the cosmos morphs again and presents another opportunity so sure. at one one hand i am it's like i i can keep failing and on the other hand that there is uh, always infinite uh, possibility sure. that absolutely. that's good absolutely absolutely uh, so maybe to to bring this to a close and i i know that um this is a a, point, a topic the, the the last thing which we don't have to go into too much um as a scientist as a philosopher and people who are curious about reality and creation speaking particularly about the tantras uh in numerous traditions including sufism bon tantra uh there is um the idea of something like a shakti chakra the 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 body which somehow the way i understand it which probably is not correct is a, a fractal or a microcosm of the macrocosm that all the energies that are that are out there which could include include the whole cosmology is somehow present in the body and it connects um to simplify this deep topic it connects with sound somehow as well sound with sound mm-hmm. uh, you know and uh like in my city the sanskrit alphabet and they they have a similar sort of sound combination of vowels and consonants in kabbala mm-hmm. and in in sufi mysticism as well mm-hmm. and that this somehow is deeply intertwined um uh, with the cosmology often the the deities at uh, at times can be uh embodiment of these sounds sure so maybe this is a is something we'll dissect later but i just wanted you to sure to yeah i think this is a topic should get Maybe. for later yes but i think generally we think about seed syllable like every tantric deity have their own seed syllable seed syllable is nothing more than the few pure vibration of a un, pure unique uh, code vibration of energy so uh, by invoking that tapping into that energy is the way to tap into those those higher field so um, and as simple as like even like when you say ah ha it's very different you can say ah, breathe for example when you breathe out ah, just sound you can maybe not produce any sound 
you don't hear any sound. If I exhalation produces sound, it's natural sound. Ha is the natural sound of exhalation of breath through the mouth. When you are, when you sound it, you see vibration. You can feel it. So much of vibrating here. And what that vibration is doing is doing it's opening. What is opening is a different field of energy which is our block. It's opening it. Usually, we we in the West generally we think about you 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 cut the heart and do the surgery, but you don't think about opening energy things like that. So these are all a power and understanding of the sound. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a big topic. Yes, yes, it is. But uh, I I know that with the explosion of interest in tantra, uh, the audiences are very curious to um, the, you know as these are hidden a hidden science that yeah. is now seems like it's becoming open and sure. available. Sure. So, um, Rinpoche, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This opportunity, I'm so grateful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.